Uh, today I was going to talk about the greatest gigs and experiences I've ever seen in my life. The generation before me, my father's generation, he was born 1927, my father, Stuart Boyce Osborne, he was a part of that greatest generation. I'm a part of the next to the greatest generation. So when I was growing up in the 1950s, we had a 78 RPM record player and a radio. When I was born in Milford, Massachusetts in 1949. So I used to hear things like, uh, how much is that doggy in the window on a 78 arm RPM record player? When I was in the fourth grade, I found out about Barros in Mexico. Barros. So I found out there was a different life than driving to school in a school bus when you're a little kid. I had a paper route between the fifth and eighth grade in Massachusetts. One Saturday I was almost done with my route and I could see a sheet of rain coming towards my bicycle. First time I met an African American, I was 10 years old at a Word of Life camp, Christian camp. Bible camp in New York State. He was a guy from Flatbush in New York. And I said, well, these people are normal people. In 1957, my uncle Tony Ozella had a baptism party for his daughter. That's the first time I got to see two guitars, bass, and drums live, like right there. <laughs> feet away from where I was standing and I was I went home and I looked at a Sears Roebuck catalog from about the age of seven till about the age of 14 15 just looking at guitars I loved listening to rock radio as I got to hear it about 1959 probably purple people eater all that stuff that was on the radio when I was in the fourth grade in Sherbin uh, Dizzy Gillespie became the great jazz trumpeter. He came to my school. And I guess, uh, I don't remember if he brought a quartet with him or anything, but he came and gave a short address, I guess, to the, everybody in the gymnasium. In 1963, I got to hear Del Shannon on the radio sing From Me to You. This was the Beatles hit, but the Beatles weren't known yet. This was before they arrived. At that time, I would listen to my radio. You know, I was living 25 miles out of Boston, and I would hear New York radio uh, play hits, and three weeks later, they would be popular in Boston. 1963, I was at Shopper's World in Framingham, and I got to meet Bobby Rydell, the famous singer, got his autograph. Uh, he was in a model car uh, hobby shop, and that's where I was. I had made uh, you know, plastic cars, boats, planes, all that stuff, Ravel, glue. And that was at the same mall, the Shopper's World was the same mall where uh, myself and my two brothers got to see Lawrence of Arabia. We moved to California in uh, late 1963, a couple weeks after John F. Kennedy was assassinated. And in early 64, I went with my father to the Cow Palace to a rock concert. Uh, I think Bobby Rydell was singing there. Probably had Chuck Berry, uh, Clovers. I can't remember. At that time, I was listening to Cliff Richard and the Shadows. Lead guitar player of the Shadows was a guy named Hank B. Marvin. And uh, I just loved the twang of the guitar. 
I go ahead a few years. I got to see Brian Jones before he drowned in the bottom of the swimming pool. It's with the Rolling Stones. Keith Richards had a Gibson Firebird. This was at the uh, San Jose Civic Auditorium here in San Jose, California. And uh, I guess they were the opening act for the Beach Boys. In 1965, I started playing guitar on my 15th birthday in 1964. My parents got me a cheap uh, $30 guitar. They rented it and they said, well, you got a job uh, emptying out the uh, dumpsters of uh, garbage at that uh, apartment complex out in Santa Clara. You could pay off the other $20 and keep the guitar. We've rented it for one month. So I taught myself how to read sheet music using a 1938 Nick Maniloff book, pretty dry stuff compared to what we were hearing on the radio. This, so I started playing guitar about two months after the Beatles were on Ed Sullivan. Everybody was going nuts with that stuff. And I started playing bass the year later, 1965. I played bass in a dozen bands. In 1967, I was in a band called the Beef Eaters, and we used to practice in the basement of a uh, location at uh, in the Burbank neighborhood on West San Carlos that is currently a Middle Eastern restaurant. But way back then, we used to practice in the basement of that location there and worked with a guy named Dave Aguilar, well-known uh, blues rock singer at the time. And uh, we were the house band uh, at the Continental Roller Bowl. I saw lots of bands play there, but we were the house band. And I had people like John Fogarty come up to me when I was 17. And he said, oh, your band is better than the band going on at the other end of the hall. Now it turned out to be the Chocolate Watch Band, who eventually cut an LP. But we were a bunch of blues rock guys doing Eric Burden and the Animals. We thought we were real hip because we were playing some songs by the Pretty Things, and a lot of people weren't aware of that stuff. You had to be really searching out British blues bands, etc. To find that stuff and get it in your possession, learn how to play it. I remember learning the chords to the first Who album in three hours. Uh, way back then. I got to see the Buffalo Springfield uh, months before they finally broke up. And that was in December of 1966. Uh, I spent all my food money on British blues band LPs. I passed out in the Fillmore Auditorium where the concert was and eventually woke up, etc. and hitchhiked home, yada yada. I saw Eric Clapton, Ginger Baker, Jack Bruce, The Cream. I sat in a chair 12 feet in front of the band at the old Fillmore Auditorium. That was in September of 67, a few months after I graduated high school. I uh, was at the Wheels on Fire double LP concert in 1968. Back then, uh, in March of 68, I started collecting 78 RPM records. I did another talk months ago about uh, bidding on Robert Johnson records in the 1960s. But back then, I used to drive around in my car, had a, a 59 Ford, I guess, and uh, I used to drive to San Francisco. There's a place called Jack's Records, and he was pure 78 RPM records. I can't remember if he had any LPs at all. He had other shops in San Francisco, the Magic Flute, you could buy rare LPs there, used LPs, etc. But I used to buy Lonnie Johnson 78's Mint Condition from the 1930s, Lightning Hopkins. Also around that time I got to know John Goddard who owned Village Music. In Rolling Stone issue number six, he was voted, his shop in Mill Valley was voted the best record store in Northern California. And uh, what was I going to say about... 
I collected the Rolling Stone magazine and I eventually sold 382 issues to Rolling Stone magazine. I think in 1976 I walked into the Rolling Stone offices in San Francisco having taken the elevator up to whatever floor it was on. And I walked in and they had the covers of the magazines all over the walls. And I asked the secretary, I said, how come you don't have issues one through six? And she said, well, we didn't know the magazine was going to take off, so we never kept them. I said, well, I got them. She said, write your phone number down here. Uh, so I stayed in touch. And eventually, in 1980, I bought my Daniel Friedrich. I bought a 1969 Daniel Friedrich, which I had for about seven and a half years, and eventually traded it for a David Rubio guitar, which I wouldn't do today. Market value is drastically different. But uh, I uh, got $1,800 from Rolling Stone for six cartons, sent COD to the offices in New York in 1980. In 1969, I got to see Sun House live in person in the flesh. I was real nervous. I, I, I would, after the concert was over, I was standing 10 feet away from five feet away, and I just watched people talk to him. I couldn't talk to him. I was kind of tongue-tied, I guess. And I remember I invited Bill Thompson. Bill Thompson was the guy who was a record collector for 20 years before I was. I was about 19 when I was collecting 78 RPM records. I'm 73 years old now. And uh, I told Bill Thompson, hey, Sun House is going to be playing. So, well, I just want to remember him in the old days. And so Sun House did My Black Mama, things like that in 1927. He was playing guitar about two and a half years, I guess, by the time he recorded that uh, 78, playing hot slide guitar uh, for uh, Paramount Records. My Black Mama eventually became, as a lot of you know, uh, Walkin' Blues by Robert Johnson. Let's see here, in the late 60s I got to see B.B. King, Booker T, and the MGs and Frank Zappa at the old Fillmore Auditorium, San Francisco. It was kind of funny, first set, B.B. King singing. Uh, let's see if I can remember the lyrics. My brother's in Korea and my sister's down in New Orleans. And he sang the same lyrics in the th second set. And some guy yells out, yeah, we already know. <laughs> Let's see. I saw Robin Ford long before he became famous. He was with the Ford brothers. This was about 1970, be what, 52 years ago, at 10th and Williams downtown San Jose, played in a club. Uh, later in the early 70s, I got to see him at the Bodega Club, now closed, but that was open for many years. And that's when Robin Ford was into playing saxophone. Let's see, I got to meet Barry Hansen, who later became Dr. Demento. I met, him, I met Barry Hansen pre-demented uh, at Will Winterland. We happened to be sitting next to each other on the floor at Winterland concert, Stevie Winwood with Traffic. Eventually, I got to meet Dr. Domeno uh, as I was hanging out with Henry Vestine and Al Wilson, guys in Canned Heat. I got to know him. I wasn't famous, obviously, but uh, I, got, I was a record collector, and there were not a lot of record collectors. Uh, probably more people getting tickets, driving cars too fast, than there were record collectors in the state of California. And uh, so I, I used to go hang out with Henry and listen to 78s. If you see the first Canned Heat album, uh, I was in that house that was the small cottage behind his main house in Pacific Palisades. And uh, somehow I got Dr. Demano's phone number and I went to visit him. Uh, he was living in Topanga Canyon with uh, Mark Andes, the bass player for Spirit. This is like 1969, I guess. I would hitchhike to Los Angeles. Uh, and uh, got to hear Hambone, Willie Newburn, Dr. Domeno, uh, Barry Hansen, Barrett Hansen, uh, had an incredible library of 78 RPM records. He bought them in the days. Now they sell for thousands of dollars. 
Actually, 78s can go up to maybe $15,000 now for the rarest of the blues 78s that exist. Some of those, some of the Robert Johnson records actually had 400 pressings, very similar to uh, Vessel Osman banjo stuff from 1906. You can find out there's enough uh, literature out there in hardbound books where you can find out how many copies were printed. Let's see. Uh, I got to see Rod Stewart when he was working with Jeff Beck, and they played at uh, Carousel Ballroom at that time, and uh, along with Moby Grape. And at that time, uh, Singer, uh, and it was an ex-Marine, I forget his name, lead singer Moby Grape. And uh, I got to see Taj Mahal in the tube is literally just about impossible to see Taj Mahal and the four tubas videos on YouTube. I'm hoping that this stuff eventually surfaces because he'd do a diving duck blues boom 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 and it was just great. Taj Mahal and four tubas. We're all a bunch of gray haired guys now. Let's see, I went to the Altamont Stones uh, concert in what, December 1969. I saw Meredith Hunter's body on the ground after he had been stabbed. Uh, I was up by the, uh, uh, front of the stage, or just off the stage, and uh, happened to see that from maybe, I don't know, 20, 30 feet away. There was just a clear walkway to where you could see that. i tell you the greatest. I saw Jimi Hendrix five times in my life. I didn't get in a classical guitar, flamenco guitar, till about 1978. So there was all these uh, pop, rock, uh, great guys I got to see. I graduated high school the um, weekend of Monterey Pop Festival. So my parents said, look, we took you to band rehearsals for years now as a bass player. Let us see you graduate high school. So I did. and. Um, they got to see me get the diploma and six o'clock in the morning, my friends uh, Rick and uh, Fritz Bruning uh, drove to Ensenada and they dropped me off at the Monterey Pop Festival Fairgrounds in Monterey. So I got to see Hendrix and uh, a bunch of the other guys. I missed the Friday night concert, uh, the Canned Heat stuff, uh, Simon and Garfunkel but I eventually got to hang out with the Canned Heat guys. And uh, but I saw Hendrix uh, at Winterland, and the most incredible thing, uh, people yelled out for him to do Foxy Lady. So he does a couple guitar solos, plays it for eight minutes. He stops playing, gets a lot of applause. People start yelling again, Foxy Lady, Foxy Lady. He, Jimi Hendrix played Foxy Lady twice in a row. Same thing happened to uh, uh, Domingo Pratt when he played in Barcelona in 1920. Uh, he played uh, La Canción de la Immigrante, the, the immigrant song, not to be confused with a pop hit by the same title years later, but he got uh, uh, encore to play it in Barcelona. Let's see, I saw Mick Taylor well, long before he was in the Rolling Stones. This was with John Mayle at the uh, Winterland concert. I think that also had Albert King and um, Charlie Musselwhite, possibly. Back in those days, I loved dancing, rock dancing. Uh, I saw Santana and Cold Blood four times, Ohlone College and three other venues. In 1976, I saw Frank Zappa along with Tom Waits, who was the opening act, and that was at the Circle Star Theater in San Carlos. That was with my brother Lester. I saw Freddie King out in uh, Santa Cruz Mountains, if I can remember the town out there. There was a, a, a rock blues club can't remember the city. He had the widest lapels. I mean, the pink shirt, wide lapels that come down to the edge of his shoulders. Great player. 
saw Albert King. In February of 67, I saw Butterfield with Bishop and Bloomfield. I guess I should uh, go back to the Buffalo Springfield thing. It was actually February of 19, uh, excuse me, the Buffalo Springfield concert was December of 67, not 1966. As I mentioned, I was in a house band called the Beef Eaters, and we played at the Continental Roller Bowl uh, in 1966. I remember I played with that band at uh, Longshoreman's Hall in uh, August of 1976. Uh, excuse me, August of 1966. I think it was the weekend that Lenny Bruce died, and uh, Ian Whitcomb was the star. I forget who the third act was. Uh, but back to the Continental Roller Bowl, I saw Janis Joplin, Big Brother, Grateful Dead. Got to tell you, one time at Grateful Dead's playing, Jerry Garcia doing a lead guitar solo in Golden Roads. Bop and bump, G80, 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 G80. Note wise, up in 10th position. And the lights went out. So they finally they get the light, that problem solved. A couple minutes later, the lights go back on, the power's on. Grateful Dead starts right in the middle of the guitar solo, finishes the song. Those were the days, huh? And let's see, in the late, in the mid-70s, I guess, I met Joe Pass. I used to smoke cigarettes. I luckily quit smoking cigarettes about 1980. Seven, I guess I met somebody at the uh, dance hall uh, in San Jose, if I can remember what the place was. And a lady's father had passed away smoking camels ten years before I met her. Saddle rack. So anyway, I'm up in Menlo Park at a Joe Pass concert, and I bump into him. And uh, why? Because we're both looking for an ashtray. A year or so later, I saw him at the CPA with Ray Brown. He plays six pieces, and he says, well, that's all I know. Very funny joke. Let's see, about 1972 or 1974, I saw John Fahey, the late uh, guitar folk guitarist. Uh, and he did a thing that was kind of weird. We were waiting, you know, it was a small club on El Camino in Menlo Park. I forget the name of the club now, being 50 years ago. Um, and so we're waiting for John to come down, and a guy comes up to the microphone, he goes, look, you gotta, you gotta, everybody's gotta be quiet. John is psyching himself out to come down and play for you. So he comes down, <laughs> And he lights a cigarette, and everybody's just cold silent, you know. He lights a cigarette, and he goes. Takes a 20-second drag off a cigarette, and he goes, now you can talk. <laughs> God, what an ego trip. Let's see. Uh, I saw Charlie Bird at the uh, local jazz nightclub, gambling casino, if I can remember the name of that. He was using a Takamini, and I was like, what's this great jazz guy doing with a Takamini playing, you know, bossa novas and stuff? That was kind of weird. I almost remembered the nightclub name. City something. I saw Tal Farlow there. Tal Farlow is an incredible uh, guy. I remember asking my, this is probably about 1978, because I asked my classical guitar teacher, Byron Pang. Uh, I'm fifth generation Targa. He was fourth generation Targa. Byron studied with Jose Rey de la Torre. Jose Rey de la Torre studied in Barcelona with Miguel Yabet from 1932 to 1934. As you see, I did a talk months ago about a radiolatory concert uh, that was unknown to the world, pretty much so. 
uh, until I found the newspaper clipping and read off the titles, etc. That was um, in Barcelona, Jose Redilatore. Anyway, back to Tal Farlow. So he had no control. The whole thing I learned, you know, I, when I was a blues rock guy, had a ES-150 and an ES-175, a telly in my early rock days, etc. I had no control of the pinky finger, just like all the other rock stars that put hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in the bank. And so Tal Farlow had no control of the fingers. And I said, well, how can you play that fast? And um, I said, how can he do it with the control? He said, he just has to work harder. Might have been Pat Brown that I asked that. She was first chair San Jose Symphony violinist. Let's see, I went and saw Van Morrison about 1973 at a club in San Anselmo. I locked out. I drank too much alcohol and I drove and luckily got home, driving all the way. Saw Johnny Winter at Carousel Ballroom. That was a great show. I forget whether his brother Edgar Winter was with him or not. See, in 19. And then I got into classical guitar in October of 1978. I used to practice 15 pieces a day, had no control of the fingers, had no idea of the dynamics I was supposed to be doing. You hear me do pretty good pianismos on some of the classical guitar uh, performance I've done in the last several months. So in 1980, I saw Andre Segovia play at Masonic Auditorium. Uh, I get, due to parking problems, I got there late. So I missed the first set, and you had to be let in by the uh, people. Unknown caller. Uh, a lot of spam calls. And uh, so I sat in 19th row, and uh, Andres came on to his second set. And it was magnificent, and it was very quiet. But I found as you got accustomed to you playing with no microphone, anything like that, just a wah, just using a fuzz tone and a wah wah, no. <laughs> and so I saw Andres play from 19th row, and your ears eventually get adjusted to the quietness, and they can hear louder minutes later. Let's see, I, as I told you earlier, I used to collect 78 RPM records. I had acquired by around that time uh, four Elvis 78s, not any Sun records that were worth hundreds of dollars, but uh, things that were worth 25 bucks a piece, RCA sun, um, uh, r recordings of late 50s Elvis. And I sold those to a guy uh, who had uh, Rose Rare Records, and this was on the El Camino in Sunnyvale. He eventually moved over to uh, Bascom Avenue in the Burbank area. He, I think he's since passed away. Great guy. When I first met him, he was at the uh, Berryessa Flea Market, and he had all these LPs and uh, cardboard boxes, and I'd walk in and go, God, I'm the only guy. By the time I left, there was 12 people in the place shopping. It was great to see it. So anyway, I had these four Elvis records, and I sold them to uh, Mr. Rowe, and I took the money minutes later, and I drove to Palo Alto, where I knew I could buy some Andre Segovia 78 RPM records from the early 30s. Uh, and then I saw Andre Segovia in 1981, at the uh, Center for the Performing Arts, I bought my teacher, Byron Pang, and his wife uh, tickets, and we sat fourth row. I remember asking Byron, why is he doing that? You don't let me do this. Well, he was in a, uh, he grew up in a different period of time. Performances were different. Let's see, I sold one third of the Car Carlos Barbosa Lima tickets for the concert at La Petite Trianon, I think 1999. 
and on Sunday we had a master class and some guy came up and played Stairway to Heaven and he, I'm sitting halfway back in the audience, probably row 11 or whatever, and he looks at me like, oh man, help me get out of here, man. It's pretty incredible. When I was 19, I really fell in love with Django Reinhardt. Now I don't... Once in a while I check out new videos that have surfaced of him on YouTube, I guess, but I eventually, uh, when I was working as a uh, collator operator uh, in the printing business, you know, you'd put a roll of carbon paper, a roll of printed paper, and weave it through, and it'd get glued and numbered and cut off, and you'd put it in a box, etc. So back then, I used to be watching the forms come off the collator and say, well, I got 13 out of 20 LPs by Django Reinhardt from the Path A 20 uh, LP series. I wonder if I'll ever get them all. Eventually I got them all. Eventually I got up to 95 LPs of Django Reinhardt. It included uh, probably a dozen 10 inch LPs from the 50s. And um, I had 78s of Nuages um, besides LP versions. I eventually had 12 out of 13 versions of Nuages because he recorded it solo, recorded it with various ensembles. And um, those are some of the greatest gigs that I got to see having grown up in the 60s and eventually uh, became enlightened to classical guitar and flamenco guitar. Thank you.